Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our final session in our series on mending fences and reconciling relationships. Today's reading for those of you that are following along at home, we are in the book of Genesis, chapter 33. So, the yesterday we did a good chunk of 32. Today we're doing all of 33. So, Jacob has prepared for coming home to Esau. He, between yesterday's story and today's story, he has wrestled with God. He has taken on the name Israel. So, today is actually Jacob meeting Esau for the first time after running away to avoid Esau's wrath. So, we do have a couple icebreaker questions. As always, please feel free to leave questions, comments, concerns, answers to these questions in the comment section down below, either here on the, on the Facebook page or on the YouTube page. First icebreaker question is, when you were little, who do you remember being really afraid of? Well, when I was in the first grade, I thought my first grade teacher was an alien, but that's, I don't know if I'm necessarily afraid of her. That was just, I thought she was an alien, period, end of story, <laughs> kind of in my sixth grade mind. In terms of who I was afraid of? I mean, I thought there were monsters. I always slept with the nightlight, so probably I was afraid of the boogeyman or something like that. But in terms of actual people, I don't know if there was anyone I was necessarily afraid of, human anyway. I mean, the boogeyman, monsters under the bed, things like that. Eh. But that's about it. What about you all? When you were little, who do you remember being afraid of? Let me know in the comments below. Second icebreaker question is, what kind of family get-together do you enjoy the most? What kind do you enjoy the least? Family get-togethers that I enjoy the most are probably Christmas. The colors, the sharing of gifts there. I definitely enjoy those the most. Just family togetherness, food, the different colors that people are wearing, all the colors and lights and decorations of trees, stockings, all those things. Something about the Christmas season that's always just more magical than other seasons, other events. As for what kind of family get-together do I not enjoy the most? What do I enjoy the least? The first thing that comes to mind is funerals. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, family, the family get together where I see most of my family is at funerals when a family member has died. So, and just, you know, being that that is the only reason that or the only time that I get to see two of my cousins, I get to see one and their families to get to see one of my uncles and his wife. You just... These are very, it's unfortunate that those are the only times I really get to see them, really get to catch up with them just because they're spread all over the country and other family members, they off doing their own thing. They take trips, they are living their lives. Unfortunately, my family is not 
very close, unlike my wife's family, that is closer than anything. And to a certain extent, I actually envy it, but that's a point. So yeah, I think the one that I enjoy the least is funerals, just because of the theme of that get-together. But that's me. What about you all? What kind of family get-togethers do you enjoy the most and or enjoy the least? Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, we will get to the reading. Again, we are in Genesis. We're reading all of chapter 33. Listen now for the word of our Lord. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau, coming with his four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? he asked. Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants and their children approached and bowed down. Next Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What do you mean by all these droves I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that I that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, Let me be let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the droves before me and that of the children until I come to my Lord in Sair. Esau said, Then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Sair. Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So our first question in regards to the reading is, if you were Jacob and looked up and saw Esau coming toward you with 400 men, what would you do? Arrange my wives and children according to preference, freeze up in fear, bow down before Esau, immediately ask for forgiveness, or cry out to God for help. For me, I think I would have bowed down before Esau. You know, I am in need of Esau's 
forgiveness, and therefore I think I would ask for forgiveness. I would prostrate myself, bow down, say I am not worthy. And if Esau were to strike me down while I am prostrated, while I am averting my eyes, then that's, I suppose that would have necessarily been his right. But, you know, as he drew closer, I would have cried out saying, you know, please forgive me, please forgive me. But that's, that's my response. What about you all? If you were Jacob and saw Esau coming toward you with 400 of his men, what would you have done? Let me know in the comments below. Number two, if you were Esau, what would you do when you saw Jacob? Run to embrace my brother, give Jacob a piece of my mind, sick my 400 guys on Jacob, immediately forgive Jacob, make Joseph, Jacob squirm a little. I think I would have run to embrace him. I like to think that I'm a fairly forgiving person, so... More than likely, I would have forgiven him long before having seen him, and would have run to embrace him to show him that I have already forgiven him. Again, this is speaking hypothetically and thinking in terms of ideals, how I ideally would react to the situation, but that's me. I mean, 20 years is a long time to hold a grudge. Within that amount of time, I would hopefully have been able to forgive whoever. So I'd like to think that I would run and embrace them. But that's me. What about you all? If you were Esau, what would you have done when you saw Jacob? Kind of the reverse of the last question. Let me know in the comments below. Number three, why do you think Jacob insisted on, es on giving Esau gifts? To appease his guilt? To buy Esau's future favor? to make up for the blessing he had stolen because God had been so gracious to him because it was easier than saying, I'm sorry. Well, that, there's a definitive argu definite argument for making up for the blessing that he had stolen. He explained that as God has been gracious to me, so You know, if the Lord has found favor with you, what's a few you know, piece of cattle? In, in the grand scheme of things, maybe subconsciously, he, Jacob doesn't even realize it, but you can def there's definitely an argument for appeasing his guilt by trying to make up for the blessing that he stole. Essentially saying, what's mine is yours, giving away all of this cattle, get, potentially giving up his life should Esau be wanting revenge still. That's kind of my understanding of why he does it. Maybe you all understand differently. Let me know in the comments below how you kind of understand. Jacob's reasoning. Question four. What meeting do you sometimes not look forward to at all? Parent-teacher conferences, performance reviews, family gatherings, church service, something else. I always look forward to church services. I find them fun. I enjoy them, even as the pastor. I enjoy them even more when I'm not preaching at them. You can only give the word so long before you are in need of receiving the word. But parent-teacher conferences, I'm not a parent, so I've never really had to experience that. Um, family gatherings, I enjoy them. From the, for the most part. Um, I think for me, it's performance reviews. 
finding out what I haven't been doing well, finding out if people have potentially not been honest with me, not been upfront with me and wondering, you know, what have I done that has made them feel they can't approach me about these issues? So on and so forth, I think. Performance reviews, just being someone who has test anxiety, has had test anxiety for as long as I can remember. It's sort of like walking into a test. How am I going to do? How am I going to score, so to speak? So I think performance reviews are meetings that I am not necessarily the biggest fan, the biggest fan of, but that's me. What about you all? What meeting are you sometimes not the most excited about? Let me know in the comments below. Question number five, what do you find can hold you back from mending strained relationships in your life? I'm ready, they're not. It's too late. The timing isn't right. The pain is too fresh. Having tried before and been rejected or something else. Um, in terms of mending strained relationships, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but definitely you know, our being ready, their not being ready, that can put a strain on things. You mending broken relationships, it has to be a mutual effort. It can't be one way. There has to be a mutual desire for that mending of relationships. <clears throat> In terms of it being too late, I would argue that it's never too late to apologize. It's never too late to mend relationships. It's never too late to reconcile relationships. And even if that is sort of a mentality of it's been 20 years, you still haven't apologized, your time is up. It, this is kind of ironic to, you know, coming from someone who insists on being everywhere early, but better late than never. You know, the pain being too fresh, that is definitely an argument that can be made for what might hold reconciliation of relationships back. If you are hurting and you are trying to reconcile a relationship because you know it's the right thing to do, yes, it's the right thing to do. No one wants to be walking around holding a grudge, having broken relationships. That's not a good feeling. However, if the pain is too fresh, if the scars are still hurting, if they're not even scars, they're wounds, they're, for lack of a better phrase, bleeding, if there's something that have not healed yet, it may be that the timing isn't right. It might be that the pain is too fresh. That you need to heal a little bit before you can approach that person, those people, and say, let's try this again. Let's try reconciling this relationship. The other one that they give is uh, having tried before and been rejected. That's a possibility too. You know, either having been rejected before or the anticipation of being rejected, the possibility of being rejected. Those two are very real possibilities. So, and no one really likes feeling rejected. You know, the possibility of rejection is something that can be hindering. But at the same time, you 
you won't know if you're going to be rejected unless you try. And past events don't necessarily dictate how things are going to go. People change. You might try to reconcile a relationship with a friend when you're in high school. I am not the same person I was in high school. I'm not the same person I was in seminary. And that's my most recent formal education. People change. It's always worth trying. Even if there is the possibility of rejection, it's always worth trying. Anyway, maybe I'm rambling. <laughs> That's my response, but what do you all think? What do you find has hindered the mending of strained relationships in your life? Let me know in the comments below. Question six, what do you usually find harder to do? To extend or to accept an apology? For me, it's, um, I think it's accepting an apology. I'm, I'm quick to apologize. I'm quick to apologize maybe a little too much <laughs> simply because I'm slow to accepting the forgiveness rather than the apology. But of those two, I'm quicker to give an apology than I am to accept it. You know, I'm the one who has to forgive. So I'm the one that has to so to speak, heal before I can offer the forgiveness as it were. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Not that I'm necessarily holding a grudge that whole time, but time heals all wounds and sometimes I need a little bit more time to offer, to accept an apology than to offer it for my wrongs to someone. It's the best way I can explain it. What about you all? Which do you usually find harder to do? To apologize or to accept an apology? Let me know in the comments below. Number seven, what have you found helpful in dealing with difficult relationships? Prayer, making a kind gesture, letting time heal, making up but keeping distance, or something else. With difficult relationships, you know, letting time heal. Not rushing into forgiveness because you know, forgiveness is the right thing to do. There's a time and place for everything. Ecclesiastes tells us to everything there is a season. So in dealing with difficult relationships, definitely prayer, asking for guidance, asking for the spirit to move within me to a place where I can heal, where I can forgive, where I can move forward with reconciling that relationship. Also just taking time. Yeah, if that means taking a break from the relationship to as it were, to kind of get back and have a fresher start than trying to mend a relationship while also mending wounds. I think for me it's prayer and letting time heal. That's, that's mine though. What about you all? What have you found helpful in dealing with mending difficult relationships? Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, we will 
end with the final question, which is simply, how can this group pray for you? As always, if you have prayer requests, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Shoot me an email, give me a phone call, whatever works for you. I'm always happy to pray with and pray for you all and to help meet your needs however I can. But that's it for this series. Not knowing what series I'm going to do next, I probably will not be doing a Bible lesson tomorrow. I'll probably start up a new series on Monday. So, so until Monday, stay well, stay safe, God bless.